Good morning, everyone. Archbishop Richard Gagnon here in the Archdiocese of Winnipeg, and this is our Friday morning report. Thank you uh, every Friday, you know, so many of you watch our Friday morning report. And uh, as you know, it's a opportunity for myself as your Bishop to share with you um, information from the diocese and to respond to questions. And uh, there's always a lot to talk about. So first of all, I would simply say that um, we're making progress in the area of the vaccinations in the province of Manitoba. Uh, as of July the 14th, uh, the walk-in clinics will be administering vaccines for people who walk in. So that is a positive thing. It comes under the title Vaxathon. There's a real push to get as many vaccinations out there as possible. And so we heard just the other day that the provincial government in the very, very near future, don't have a date yet, will be loosening up the restrictions even more. Uh, that's how I kind of thought it would be. I think that when, when, the, when the loosening up begins to roll out, it'll roll out quite quickly, as it has in British Columbia, where things are more or less approaching normalcy uh, as they were prior to the uh, pandemic. I think in, in Manitoba, we're a little bit behind that, but we are making progress in that direction. Now, the COVID reality in Canada is still an issue. Uh, in Manitoba, there are 990 active cases, and in, the, in that number, 147 hospitaliza hospitalizations, and 33 people are in intensive care. There are 70 new, 71 new cases, and there have been recent deaths of two people, uh, both on the younger side and in both cases regarding one of the variants. And so even though our vaccinations are increasing, all this looks very good, let us not let our guard down. We continue to follow the provincial protocols, uh, mitigating the, the virus, and we're seeing, we're seeing results from that. It's very sad to hear about these infections that are still around, but uh, we're, we're working at that and we're making progress for sure. Thank you for all your good efforts, all of you. Um, if you have received your second vaccine, so I am told, you can go to the provincial website and uh, learn how to acquire, if you wish to, an immunization card. That's after your second vaccination, uh, two weeks after you received your second vaccination. So a little bit of information there for you. Thank you very much for that. A couple, I have three questions this week, uh, all different questions, so I'll do my best to respond to them as best as I can. The first bit question goes like this, uh, Archbishop, I am sure you have been inundated with emails, letters, and phone calls regarding the recent tragic discoveries. Well, that, that's definitely true, I can tell you that. Many of which are filled with anger and sadness. My question is, how can we engage you and your ministers in meaningful dialogue without being disrespectful? Um, thank you very much for that question. I, I don't know if I fully understand the, the, um, the nuances in your question, but I will try to answer as I think, uh, as I think you are asking. I'll respond to your question as I understand it. That's what I'm trying to say as best as I can. Um, you know, I think the first question thing I'd like to say to you with regards to the residential school question, which has really dominated our country in the last month in a very uh, important way, that uh, I would say myself and our clergy and, and religious of the Archdiocese of Winnipeg, and that we're not unique in this, um, we, are, we are learners. Um, we are learners with regards to this question of residential schools. So just like most Canadians, uh, from my age category downwards, you might say, um, we're learners. And, and so when, when people approach me about this question, I always say, you know, well, that's, I'm trying to understand more and more about this question, because I think many Canadians have very many legitimate questions about it. They want to learn more about it. And that's a good thing in itself, I think. 
You must know too that many of our priests and religious in the Archdiocese of Winnipeg, uh, the same as many other dioceses, are from other countries and they are not familiar with our history very much. That's, that's an important aspect. But interestingly enough, many of them, I've learned, have their own experiences of colonialism and the effects of colonialism. And they do provide some interesting perspectives about that that I think our Canadians can learn from. So my first reaction to your question is that we are learners. And so uh, that's an important thing to know, that we wanna learn about this together and always seek the truth for greater understanding. When it comes to respectful dialogue, as you mentioned in your question, I think an important aspect of respectful dialogue is listening. I think that's really key um, because uh, when we always try to insert our narrative, our ideas, our agenda, as they say nowadays, instead of listening carefully to what the other party has to say, then we're not going to get a dialogue. A dialogue is a two-way two understanding of things. Pope Francis is very good at, dia at dialogical approaches to things. When I mentioned our delegation to Rome this coming uh, December, that's exactly what it'll be. It'll be a dialogue. And he sits down, he listens, he responds. I mean, there's a respectful reality there. And I think that serves as a good model for all of us. A couple of things about the listening, I think, which I, I personally find interesting. 1986, I think it was, when Pope St. John Paul II, he was going to the United States and he flew over Canada. He put down at uh, Fort Simpson in the Northwest Territories as he promised he would visit the indigenous people in the Northwest Territories uh, when he couldn't do that in 1984 because of heavy fogs that prevented him from landing in Yellowknife. Some of you may remember that particular incident. Well, when he came to Fort Simpson, there was a great white teepee that was set up there. And that was very close to the uh, runway of the airport. So his plane put down and he entered the teepee and the teepee was a large one. It was filled with elders and leaders of the indigenous communities in those regions. Some of those people traveled a long way to get there. Well, it was kind of the sort of the classic kind of a listening circle idea. People sat in a circle, they, they talked, they expressed themselves and so on. And uh, St. John Paul II just sat there, he listened. He didn't say hardly anything at all. He just simply listened. Very little response from the Pope, but he listened carefully. And uh, after the, the session was finished, he got up and he left and he went outside. He gave a talk outside, uh, you know, to the public and that sort of thing. But his approach to listening to the people in that big white teepee uh, very much made an impression on the Indigenous leadership, the elders at that time, because they saw the Pope as a person who knows how to listen and to appreciate what's being said to him. I, I think that is a good model for us, actually. And uh, it's a, one of those little incidences in Canada, a very important historical moment um, that happened that is very helpful to us, I think. The Indigenous people often have listening circles in which people sit around in a circle and they express themselves. Sometimes it could be quite an emotional experience. It could be certain things bothering people, maybe a matter of residential schools, could be any number of things. But as you go around the circle and you're given something to hold that gives you the, uh, the floor, you might say, or the authority to speak, could be a stone, could be a feather, could be a talking stick. Um, as you go around the circle, after maybe going around the circle once or twice or three times, you'll notice a very interesting dynamic that occurs. The original uh, expression of thoughts in that first go around often change when people have a chance to express themselves, but then they listen to other perspectives and they learn from that experience going around the circle. I would say that's a respectful dialogue. It's a good model that needs to be practiced, you know, more and more. It's, it's not the model we find in parliament, that's for sure, where people are really yelling at each other. They're not listening very well. No, it, it, it's sort of the opposite to that. So I think that's a good model to use as well. Listening to one another, 
uh, for respectful dialogue is very important. I'll share with you another important thing that came my way years ago when I was not in Winnipeg. And I think in this Friday morning report, it should be, it should uh, share that with you. It was my personal experience of a, a listening circle or sharing session with indigenous people who attended residential school. They were survivors now in their fifties and sixties. And there were some of the religious nuns who taught in the school. They had not met for decades and decades. And when they came together, it was very, very tense. It was a very tense moment. And uh, I wasn't too sure how it was going to go. I was listening. I was, I was not really part of that dialogue, but I was in attendance there. I was right with them. Small number of people, maybe a dozen people altogether. And as the sharing went on, and as the listening went on, the dynamic began to change. And I reached the point where the religious that were there began to express their understanding at a deeper level of some of the pain that was experienced by the indigenous people during their time of residential school. And some of the indigenous people expressed things such, such as gratitude to the religious for giving them an education. And the religious also recognizing the spin-offs from residential schools into families and problems. And some of the indigenous people recognizing the difficulties the religious had, often young women coming from far away into a very different environment and struggle, their struggles that they had as young women at the time in residential schools. There was a complete shift in the dynamics of that meeting and it was profound. And I always remember that experience, that listening to one another, we begin to learn more about things. So I think that probably is what I would like to say to you who asked that question. We are learners, but we must learn to listen so we can grow in understanding. The pursuit of understanding is a very noble pursuit and very important for the human person. Thank you for the question. The second one is much less profound than that first question, I can assure you. The question is phrased like this. Your Grace, other bishops in North America have withdrawn the general dispensation from Sunday Mass. What is the thinking behind extending it for another couple of months? Well, we have extended the uh, dispensation for Sunday Mass to September the 12th. I have that date right, I believe it's true. Um, but do remember that it, in different locations in North America, uh, the pandemic uh, and the experience of the pandemic and the restrictions that are attached to the pandemic in the local regions is different. Uh, Manitoba is not Vancouver, British Columbia or Montreal, Quebec. We have our own level of the spread of the virus we have our own level of the need for restrictions. And therefore, when it comes to Sunday dispensation, which is tied to the restrictions and the difficulties of the pandemic, it's going to be a little different in Manitoba than it would be, let us say, in Florida or some other places. So that would explain why we have at this point an extension in our dispensation. However, when things change, which I suspect they will rapidly, um, one would expect a bit of flexibility in that. And if there is a flexibility or a change of date, uh, our people will be certainly notified about that. Okay, thank you very much for the question. Uh, the last question, again, is an excellent question, uh, well-researched, and it's part of a longer email, but we took out the core of it. It goes like this, what should our response as Catholics be in the face of calls to rename things that are named after Venerable Bishop Vital Grandin um, and discussions that call the bishop's historical legacy into question. How should we as Catholics understand the controversial legacy of Bishop Grandin while at the same time reverencing him as a man who lived heroically virtuous and saintly life dedicated to evangelization? Excellent question. 
How can this be accomplished while actively pursuing reconciliation? Well, I don't know if I can do you uh, proper uh, do uh, to that question because it's quite a profound question, but I'll do the best I can. I have to say, first of all, that I'm not an expert on Bishop Grandin. Um, I'd like to learn more about him, and maybe your question has kind of spurred that desire a little bit more in my life. Um, we do know this about, I do know this about Bishop Grandin, uh, his historical figure in Western Canada, associated also with residential schools. Uh, Bishop Grandin held strong views uh, regarding the importance of assimilating Indigenous culture into Canadian European culture. Uh, he expressed these views. Uh, so he had strong views about that. And um, that's, that's particularly important today with the current uh, discussion and consideration in the public square. Uh, but this question about Bishop Grandin has been raised before. Um, for example, you know, Bishop Grandin Boulevard in, in, uh, in Winnipeg, certain schools with his name on it and so on. This has been raised before because of an awareness in recent years of his close attachment to residential schools and his uh, belief in uh, assimilation to the degree that he had in these schools, cultural assimilation. So today, I think it's important that we listen to what the Aboriginal people are saying about Bishop Grandin helps us kind of see how he is perceived by people with regards to the residential school. That's an important factor today that has been raised quite, um, quite strongly. I think though, as a Catholic, we'd have to say this, that in that, in that question of the schools and his approach to education, that it, it really is at variance with the church in modern times, the way the church in modern times thinks about culture and faith. And I would refer you to many examples of St. John Paul II, who spoke a lot about culture and how faith and culture are closely connected together, how faith grows within culture, how, how culture complements faith. Uh, Pope John Paul II did a lot, a lot of work in that area. And in his visit to Canada in 1984, with the many encounters with Indigenous people, I'm thinking of Ontario for one, Midlands, he spoke an awful lot about that and honored Indigenous culture and explained a lot about how faith is connected with culture. And so uh, Bishop Grandin's approach uh, through the uh, residential school modeling uh, was quite at variance with that, for sure. So looking at it from a Catholic point of view, it certainly is not in sync with the modern church's thinking. And I think even during the time of Grandin, that not everybody thought the way he thought. He represents a certain number of church people who thought in that particular way. Now, the removal, the removal of names from public things, such as streets, boulevards, and so on, uh, that is really a decision of the municipal government. I don't know if the, if the, if the Catholic Church had anything to do with naming uh, Grandin Boulevard in, in, uh, in Winnipeg. I have no idea. I think it was a decision of the municipal government and names can be changed in light of what I've just said about the public square and the way things are perceived nowadays, you know, the changing of those names is not necessarily hard to understand. When it comes to institutions such as schools and that sort of thing, it's not really a question for the church. It's really a question for that individual institution, what they may feel is appropriate at that time. So you're going to see these kind of things. Um, Bishop Grandin will continue to be studied as an historical figure in Western Canada, particularly. And you cannot help but study him because he played a, uh, an important part in the history of the West and that particular ministry that he had. And the same way you'll study residential schools in Western Canada. So he will continue to be a subject of historical interest as is John A. Macdonald, and many of Johnny McDonald's statues have been removed, but he will continue to be studied because of the role he played as an historical figure. So that's my attempt at answering your question. Uh, thank you very much for asking it. Well, 
I wish you all very well. I ask God's blessings on your families. Continue to do what you are doing to mitigate the virus. And uh, we look forward to an opening up of our culture and our society after a year and a half of great difficulty during these times. May God bless you and keep you in peace and in the love of Christ, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.